Hello, everyone. Welcome to John Redman, Power of Attorney, the show that aims to empower you through knowledge of the law. I'm attorney John Redman. I'm Shauna Sanford. Welcome to the show. Whether it's real life murder prosecutions or the ones on some of the most popular television shows, there is no shortage of interest in these types of cases. Today, we continue a fascinating conversation about how murders and other serious crimes are handled in Louisiana courts. And we are pleased to welcome attorney Julian Murray Jr. back to the show. Attorney Murray has decades of experience as a prosecutor. He has handled cases from murder to rape to bank robberies and other serious crimes. Many, uh, excuse me, many have made the headlines locally and nationally. Attorney Murray will join us in a few moments. You know, we learned so much from the show that we had last week, and I'm really glad that we were able to continue it this week. But we want to be very clear. If you are charged with a serious crime and you can't afford an attorney, are you entitled to free legal help? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one of the beauties of the American justice system. Um, God forbid you are that person on that hot seat and you are facing serious charges if you do not have the money to pay for a lawyer the system will provide you with competent legal counsel and uh, and that's a real blessing because the way our constitution is set up not only does the prosecution have to meet certain constitutional minimum standards they can't simply just grab anybody and accuse them of a crime and that person is going down no matter what but you also have a, a, a criminal defense attorney who's required to do his or her job to make sure that the state does its job mm -hmm. and can raise all kinds of defenses and uh, therefore um, making it very unlikely that an innocent person is going to go to jail or certainly is very much more difficult for an innocent person to go to jail. Lots to get into with Lots Attorney to. Murray. So coming up next, criminal defense attorney Julian Murray joins the show. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. If you are a fan of the CSI shows but have always wondered how realistic they are, you definitely want to hear from our guests today. Attorney Julian Murray Jr. has prosecuted many cases, some high profile, and he knows the real deal when it comes to how murder cases and other serious crimes are handled in our court system. He was with Orleans, the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office for many years and also worked as Chief of Criminal Division of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Louisiana. Now he's defending those who are accused. Julian, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's really great to have you here. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, we, we had such a great discussion uh, last week mm -hmm. talking about crimes from the prosecution perspective and de defense perspective. And we had to end our last show talking about, um, well, just some really juicy topics. And we want to continue <laughs> today. Uh, Shauna, why don't you? Yeah, don't that's you right. We ended on false confessions and talking about the number of people who actually confess to doing things that crimes that they actually didn't do because it's such a pressure cooker situation. Talk a little bit more in detail about that and how often it does happen. Well, it, I don't want to say have it real often, but often enough that uh, it's counterintuitive for the jury to believe nobody's going to confess unless they really did it. Mm -hmm. But the pressure that they're under uh, being accused, we know you did it, and you better confess type of thing. Uh, it's going to go tougher on you if you don't. Sometimes people just, uh, and it's usually low, in, uh, low intellect people, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, who just give up, or, and they just say, yeah, I, I did it, I did it. Mm -hmm. and okay, now we got the confession. And uh, more and more jurisdictions are videotaping these confessions, and it's much more reliable when they do that. In fact, there's some pressure on the FBI to do that. The FBI doesn't even record the conversations, uh, confessions. They get two agents, one person being interviewed, and uh, there's no record of that except what they write down. Wow, and, and why wouldn't, why would they not want to do that? <laughs> Indeed, I mean, they got two on one. If two agents say that this was said, and a person, I didn't say that, uh, which one the jury gonna believe? Right, they got right. two agents to right. one, right. and there's some pressure on the FBI right now to change that system. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, we talked about the David Warren case uh, last week. Uh, Travis McCabe was a uh, police officer that got convicted for supposedly stating something uh, to the FBI and to the prosecutor. He said, I never said that. Uh, the jury convicted him. The judge uh, overturned the conviction. And uh, now it's a question whether they're going to retry him. But, uh, but he said at the trial, why in the world don't you record these things? So there's no question about what was said and what wasn't said. Right, right, right. And right. Uh, they ought to do that. Uh, 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 
Jim Brown, former Secretary of State, who got in trouble uh, <laughs> simply because he was accused of telling tales to the FBI That's in an interview? Yeah, they sometimes call it the Martha Stewart uh, law, mm -hmm. 18 U.S.C. 1001, mm -hmm. false statement to a federal agent. Martha Stewart was acquitted of the substantive offense, but was convicted of lying. Same thing with Jim Brown. Mm -hmm. He was acquitted of the substantive offense, and but yet he was convicted of making a false statement. Right. So this brings me back to the question when we were talking a little bit coming back into the intro, um, we talk about the CSI shows. There are seem seemingly a gajillion different CSI shows, all of them very, very popular. People just seem to really be interested in murder investigations and in these cases. And so a lot of times what we see on TV, we think that's how it really does, you know, play out. Um, what, do, what do you make of these shows? I mean, are they helping? Are they hurting people? Better understand how the system works? Does the system really work like that? Well, it, it depends on what side you're on. Uh, it's certainly, if you have all of this scientific evidence, uh, it's going to be a, a, a certain defense uh, is not going to be believed. If you get DNA evidence, for example. But jurors then watching all these programs come to expect that. Any times of prosecution, you better have all the scientific evidence. And the prosecutors can tell you, wait a minute, sometimes it's just an eyewitness identification, but it's a good one, and that should be <laughs> sufficient. And, uh, and jurors are getting skeptical because they're watching all these programs. And in the voir dire, when you question the jurors before they're selected, that Just process, the jury, right. yeah, uh, that question starts to be asked. What TV programs do you watch? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I watch CS, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I watch Law and Order, and and then, well, do you expect that you can have that type of scientific evidence? And a lot of times the jurors say, yeah. Well, that juror gets cut. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, the prosecution doesn't want that juror because if what the prosecution has is an eyewitness who saw the guy shoot the victim, and they want to have the guy who an eyewitness saw shoot the victim. That should be all they need. But they worry the juror is going to say, "Well, where is the laser scan? You know, DNA fingerprint confirmation?" Well, they don't even have that kind of technology. <laughs> in the crime lab in New Orleans, right? So but, uh, that juror might not convict because they don't have this highfalutin technology, right? Well, uh, it's not because they don't have it in the crime lab because it's state police, uh, they can send in state police and they can do a DNA uh, testing. But it's not just that, they're all sorts of things, you know, a little piece of hair, you know, uh, uh, the fingerprints, all of this scientific right. evidence, but, but sometimes they don't have it. stuff on TV, which looks like it's something out of a Star Trek movie yeah. at times, you worry the jurors, the, the prosecution worries the juries are, going, are, are expecting you to bring out a, a special audiovisual representation where they show a holographic reproduction yeah. of the crime and they don't get that. That's correct. And then they don't convict if they don't get that. But then the, the other side of that is eyewitness identifications are mm -hmm. very, very unreliable. Uh, and it's, uh, that again shows up, uh, there's a lady that travels the country right yes. now mm -hmm. with uh, the person she identified as having raped her. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was positive that was the person. Years later, it turned out with DNA proof, there was another person, in fact, the other person with telling people in prison that he did it. Right. Uh, ha ha, and the other guy got blamed for it. Then they did the DNA test and it turned out that he in fact was the rapist. When she saw him in court, she didn't recognize him. Uh, but she felt so guilty about what she'd done that she actually travels the country and yeah. goes to seminars and yeah. things like that and talks about yeah. false identifications. Yeah. Uh, and I think sometimes he is with her when, when they yes, talk about yeah, it. It, it is an incredible story. It really is a powerful yeah. story. And it's just really hard to believe, you know, I didn't see what I thought I saw. Yeah. I mean, because you, you, you think that you, you saw this. Why is it not so reliable? It's, 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 I guess, you know, especially in a situation where you're completely taken aback, you know, just it's a, it's a, a, a shocking situation, um, then, you know, things can get distorted, even your vision. And it, sometimes it has to do with su suggestions right. by the uh, police the officer. Power of suggestion. Power of suggestion. You've got this line up. Uh, which one of them is it? Well, first of all, that presupposes that it's one of them in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you should give blind lineups, put it out, out there without telling them. Uh, then if... Uh, the person, that's the one right there. Yeah, that's the one we thought it was. Very good. Uh, see, that reinforces the, the identification. So those type of things have to be avoided, and good policemen do avoid that. Uh, th no suggestion as to who the person is. Uh, but uh, false identification happened sometime, uh, just transference. Uh, it's a psychological yeah. phenomenon that, uh, that you see somebody and 
is a bad image of something else that happened to you in your life, right. and you say, that's the one that did it. Right. And uh, it turns out it's, it's not, but yeah. those things happen. You just can't always uh, trust what you what you think you know um, <coughs> in a situation that's, like that. Uh, that's human nature. We just human nature. <laughs> yeah. and, and not to spend a, a whole lot more time on this, but you talk about the technology uh, that people expect all this technology. It's very interesting how um, in our last show we were talking about the Innocence Project mm -hmm. and how the innocent, one of the things that comes out of the Innocence Project is they reveal how false confessions happen. Uh, but another thing that happens with the Innocence Project is DNA from old rape kits that were never tested. They finally get around to testing rape kits and there are literally many thousands of rape kits today that are waiting to be tested because budgets don't, they say that the police departments, the DA say they don't have the money to test. They finally get around to testing rape kits and they realize that a significant percentage of people in jail today, many of them with life sentences, uh, they're not the guy who did it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And so that's technology today being used to, to undermine convictions and so that's where advanced technology is um, able to, to free innocent people. And where there was just a little bit of a, a specimen, a little piece of uh, a fluid, a little bit of material, 20 years ago it wasn't enough to do a good test, but today the technology allows that's them to good. do it. So that's where technology is really making a difference and freeing innocent people. Yeah. Well, also it has to do with the, uh, a lot has to do with the, the, the police and the prosecutor uh, being up front. When I was a young assistant D8 trying cases, it's an eyewitness identification, I'd get the witness in ahead of time preparing for the trial and would tell them, now, when I ask you, you have to say you're positive about the identification, otherwise uh, he's likely to get off. And then I was assigned to try a case with a, a senior assistant district attorney, yeah. and he is preparing the witness. And he says, now, look, we got somebody's freedom going on here. Mm. And if you're not positive, you let us know, because I don't want you to say you're positive if you're not. And I sat back and I said, well, that really is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, mm -hmm. and I changed my approach. You can't just tell, you got to say you're positive, you ask them. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes it's just that subtle approach to the prosecutor that makes a difference. Well, it's, such the, it's the reality of the situation. I mean, someone's life really is, that's a huge burden as a prosecutor that you have, because you are you could potentially put someone away, or you, you're fighting to potentially put someone in jail for the rest of his or her life, or send them to their death. Um, so that, I mean, that's that's huge, uh, the way you look at that and the way that you approach that. That's correct. And, and, and the worry is you got gung-ho police officers, police investigators, gung-ho prosecutors. They figure out they're smarter than everybody else. They figure out the guy really is guilty. So they're going to do what they need to do, even if it's bend the rules, and they're going to tell the witness, this is the guy who really did it. Trust me, this is the guy who really did it. And, and they're bending the rules, and they think that they can solve the mystery and, and cut corners, and in fact, they're sending innocent people to jail. That, uh, that's, what you're saying is true, but I have to emphasize that uh, it's the rogues that do it. Uh, it's the I rogues. Think, I think most police officers don't do it. And they're the exception do to the rule, and I want to be clear on that, too. Yeah. I don't, that's not my attitude about law enforcement mm -hmm. or the district attorney's yep. office. Those are the, the bad apples. Those are the exceptions to the rule. That's right. And even then, most of the time, it's, it's ego more than... Uh, I know who's guilty, and, I, and yeah, <laughs> this yeah. person's guilty, I know he's lying, uh, rather than saying, hey, I know he's innocent, but I'm going to get him convicted anyway. Of course. I don't think police officers do that, but you can get... That would be a monster. Yeah, you can be arrogant about your position and say, I know who's guilty and who isn't, and that's when unfairness comes into the process. Okay, we have to take a break right now. Coming up next, we're going to get to your questions for our guests, so stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. We're having a fascinating conversation with our guests today. And now it's time to get to your questions for attorney Julian Murray. And our first question this time around is going to come from Diane. And she says, is the sentence for murder always life in prison? Not always the case. No, it's not always uh, because there are different types of emerging. Bit. Manslaughter, for example, is you, you murdered someone, but uh, you're doing the heat of passion. So you would not get life in prison for that. But first degree murder it's going to be life in prison or it's going to be death. Uh, uh, 
automatic. Right, and so there's first degree, and this is not something that we've talked in great deal about, uh, detail about. There's first degree and there's second degree. That's What's right. What are some of the major differences between first degree and second degree? Well, it all requires specific intent, but as, uh, as I said in the last show, a lot of it has to do with the person whom you have killed. Uh, it's got to be premeditated, it's got to be specific intent, but if it's a police officer you kill, if it's an old person, if it's a young person you kill, or if it's someone killed in the uh, commission of a, of a rape or something like that, those are the type of things where you get the death penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, but second degree murder, it's still specific intent, it's premeditated, uh, but you don't have the, the victim who is particularly vulnerable uh, or, or important to society, like if you killed policemen, all uh, right, you kill a, a witness, uh, those type of things will get you first degree murder. Okay, and then what about negligent homicide? Well, as the word indicates, uh, you don't intend to do it, but if you're, you know, if you're driving around and you're, and you're going, you know, 60 mile an hour in a 20 mile an hour zone and you kill someone, then uh, it's negligent, uh, but it's still a homicide. Uh, yeah and it, it's going to counter jail time with it. Well, and something that I found very interesting in doing research for this show, what if I'm not actually the person who pulled the trigger, or I'm not actually the one who caused the death, but I was involved perhaps in the robbery or in helping that, you know, situation come to be? I could still be charged with murder. Oh, Is yeah. that right? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, with any trial, for example, you would call, the law calls a principal uh, to it. Uh, in other words, if you drive the getaway car, you don't rob the bank, but you drive the getaway car, then you're, uh, then you're guilty of the robbery. Mm -hmm. The sentence that you get is likely to be less than the person that actually pulls the trigger, mm -hmm. but uh, you're still just as guilty. And the same thing is true with uh, conspiracies. Uh, you can conspire to help someone. Uh, you may not be selling the dope yourself, but uh, you drive the guy to the place where he has to go to sell it, then you're a co-conspirator uh, with that person. Okay, all right. Our next question comes from Stephen, and he says, how are death row inmates executed in Louisiana? We've got a lot of questions about uh, inmates who are on death row. Yeah, it's uh, lethal injection. Uh, it used to be the electric chair, but now we do it with lethal injection, and there's litigation going on as to whether or not uh, that's cruel and unusual, depending upon what the injection is, how long a person uh, suffers before they, they die, that sort of thing. Uh, I know there's a debate about whether or not they let uh, actual medical providers provide that. It seems to me the uh, American Medical Association and medical uh, uh, medical societies debate whether or not that's uh, administering medicine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wh wh do you know about that? Well, if you have enough doctors, there could be some out there who can say, I'll put that needle in them right away. So, uh, but uh, there is a debate about that. And of course, there's a debate about capital punishment, period. Should society be killing anyone? Uh, hey, I'm just wondering how that squares with the Hippocratic Oath. Doctors swear to do no harm if it's a doctor killing somebody intentionally. But anyway, let's get to the other question. <laughs> I don't want, I, we don't have time for that debate. Very, very interesting. Our next question comes uh, from Terry. He says, what is the average cost for an attorney when it comes to these big murder cases? Oh, goodness gracious. It goes on and on and mm. on. Uh, but, I mean, it's, uh, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's not just for the attorneys, but because you get into the experts. You have to have experts. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Rick Simmons and I represented, David Warren, for example, uh, we didn't take any pay. Uh, we did it for nothing. But the experts, we went to the court, said, he's indigent, and we want you to pay for the experts. And the judge, in fact, ruled that uh, we we're entitled to have the expert paid for. So the, the cost... Gets it could be into hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. before and it's again, finally executed. For the people someone. out there, these are experts who are making determination. What, what sort of experts? Oh, it can be anything from a you say a DNA expert. It can be a psychologist. Uh, whether or not this person was uh, mentally competent, uh, mm -hmm. it can even be academicians who uh, say what the you know if, if the IQ level is below 70, mm -hmm. you can't execute them according to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So if you're right there at 70 or 71, you have a whole bunch of experts yeah, arguing sure. whether or not this person can be executed. Yeah. Uh, so it goes on and on. These cases can go on and on and on and on. I mean, there could be a conviction and then there could be a uh, push to have a, another trial. And in the case of David Warren, there was an acquittal and then you just, you mentioned in the last show, it, it still is ongoing. It's not over. So these cases could go on for a very, very long time. Even if they're not in the headlines anymore, they could still be going on. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to our next question, Ariana. She says, are eyewitnesses in murder cases protected in any way? Uh, they're supposed to be, but a lot of times the public doesn't trust 
the system to protect them. That's why a lot of people won't come forward. Uh, the federal government has a witness protection program where they give them a new identity with all of that assets and resources the federal government has. They move them to a new location, they give them a new uh, identification, uh, and they get new credit cards, everything, everything. they change them uh, so that uh, they can't be found. The state doesn't have that type of assets, but sometimes in cooperation with the federal government, uh, they can get them put into that program. Mm -hmm. But uh, the public just doesn't trust them. Oh yeah, we'll protect you. But yeah, when this whole thing's over with and his cousin comes after me, where are you going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of times people won't come forward for fear that uh, they won't be protected. Right. Uh, Walter wants to know what role does DNA play in murder cases? We were talking about that a little bit before the break. Well, yeah, it, it's uh, a lot of times we're learning now uh, through Barry Sheck's program and right. Emily Maugh's program, this Innocent Project, that uh, years later they open up one of those kits and, <laughs> and they keep them. They, uh, they keep them for years and years and years, and all of a sudden they look at the DNA and say, we got the wrong person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so it's- They can uh, still be used present day in the, in the ongoing prosecution. They can be used in the ongoing defense uh, before there's a, a, a jury verdict. They can be used at present, um, not always. It depends on what evidence is collected, correct? That's correct. In fact, uh, I'm involved in a case now. It's not uh, my client. My client's a co-defendant. But one of the prime clients in there, the DNA evidence against him, and the defense attorney goes to the court and says, I want my own DNA expert. And the DNA expert uh, lives in Hawaii. And the FBI says, if you want to examine the, the actual sample, you got to come to our <laughs> lab in Washington, D.C. Wow. Well, you can imagine the expense that gets involved in this type of case. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's also important to point out, because we talked about statute of limitations in the show, uh, last week's show, but when it comes to trying to determine whether someone is innocent, like through DNA and, and perhaps other um, options that are available, there is no statute of limitations. As you said, these cases could be very, very old, but you can still go back, however old the case may be, Correct. And and try to see if that person is in fact guilty or not guilty. That's correct? correct. No statute of limitations as far as None that, on that is None concerned. On that. No, but it has to be innocence. Uh, you, there's a limitation of how far you can go back and just simply say, well, I didn't have a fair trial. Ah, okay. Uh, there's a limitation on that, but uh, not on actual innocence. Actual innocence can be brought up at any time. Okay. So in terms of if I, you know, if someone just has, a, or just, but if someone has an issue with whether they uh, did receive a fair trial, I guess depending on the kind of case, the kind of charge, then there would be a statute of limitations. It would, but it would depend on the type of case it it was. Is that how it works? Yes. Uh, of recent. I mean, when you go into the, the federal court system, uh, you've got one year from the final conviction in the state court system to bring it. It didn't used to be that way. When I represented Wilbert Rito and got him out of jail after 43 years, we went back to the selection that took place of the grand jury and challenged that. You couldn't do that today. You only have one year to do it. But at, at that time, uh, there was no limitation on when you could go back. And we, in fact, went back 43 years and found out it was a bad indictment. Now, what would you do if, let's say, you um, you know you can't afford? You're in a, s a situation where you've been charged with a serious crime. Uh, you can't afford an attorney. The court appoints an attorney for you. But what if you and that attorney just don't gel? You just are not getting along with that attorney. You don't like him or her for whatever reason. Yeah. Then you, what's the sort of option? That, you say, I don't think this attorney's good, or you you just have your you don't have faith in that attorney. Yeah, you, and you you do get some of that and. Uh, and within limits, the court will allow the first attorney to withdraw and, and appoint another attorney, but they're not going to keep doing that over and over again. One of the things that the, the, the defendant doesn't like is that you're being paid by the state, or by the, the government. Wait a minute, the same people that are prosecuting me are paying your salary to defend me? And uh, yeah, yeah. so, uh, They you worry know, there's a conspiracy going yeah, on? Uh, so you run into that quite often. Uh, but uh, as I say, you can get out of it, and the attorney, all it, if you don't trust me, look, I'd rather withdraw and have somebody else yeah. uh, represent you. Because uh, when you're the criminal defense attorney, you have to have your client have faith in you so they'll open up to you and answer your questions fully and completely. Otherwise, you can't really do your job defending that person. That's correct. correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have another question um, from Cecil. It says, what is bail bond and how does it work? Well, the bail bond, sometimes it can be what they call a recognizance bond. In other words, you come in, you sign a bond, you agree to be responsible to show up. Uh, but bail bondsmen get, if you've got a $50,000 
bail set on you, then they come in and usually for 10, 12% uh, of that amount, uh, you pay them and they put up to $50,000 bond. If you skip out, then the bonds would have to come in to theoretically pay off the rest of that bond. And the bond is posted so you can be out of jail while you're waiting your trial. That's correct, yeah, while you're waiting your trial. And of course, the bondsman having an interest in not having to pay that money also has an interest in watching the defendant. And I want to make sure I know where you are, you check with me each week and things uh -huh. of that sort. So uh -huh. uh, it's an extra safeguard for the public. Uh, but is bail always um, set, you know, once you've been arrested? It doesn't always happen. Not always. Uh, and quite often it's set at such a high amount that as a practical matter you don't have any bail at all. Uh, in the federal system, that, that's supposed to be allowed. Uh, but uh, it can be a bail bond that's higher than you're able to make. Uh, but you can't just arbitrarily put it up there to keep someone from making making bail. Yeah. Well, we are just about to close out on uh, this program. And, and before we leave, just a final word to folks out there who really do enjoy watching those crime shows as we're watching them. What is it that you would want folks to keep in mind in terms of what they see on TV and how things really work in the real system? Well, it have to be practical solutions to it. I mean, you can't expect every case that you're picked as a juror uh, to have all the scientific evidence. But also, uh, you have to be careful about eyewitness identifications and confessions as being foolproof. So somewhere in between there, uh, the state has to come in and have proof beyond a reasonable doubt uh, based upon the totality of the evidence. Okay, all right, Good fantastic. Advice. Great show, lots of wonderful information. Thank you so very much for being oh, with us. I enjoyed it, I enjoyed <laughs> it very much, thank you. Learned a lot. That's all the time that we have for now. Be sure to join us again next time for another great legal topic. Brief clarification, it was Jim Brown was the insurance commissioner, not secretary of state. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much to our guest. Thanks all of you for watching. Be sure to visit johnredmondpoa.com to get links to everything we talk about on the show and to send your questions. You can also get in touch with us through Facebook, Twitter, and email. We'll see you next time on John Redmond, Power of Attorney.